So, welcome everyone. Um, just to put these talks into context, they came about um, because I, as artistic director, uh, endeavour to ask the lead artist on each production, and that's normally the director, but it can be the writer, or, or the, bo the pair of them, um, a question about what they think fundamentally they're exploring in the production. And uh, sometimes those uh, questions take formal effect, so uh, with King Charles III, that some of you may have seen that we did uh, last year, that was very much an inquiry about um, what, uh, could you write a, sh a play in, in the Shakespearean black verse idiom? in a contemporary setting, uh, but more often they take uh, a, a thematic uh, or, or socio-political or, or interpersonal inquiry. And uh, so when I asked James McDonald and uh, Anne Carson uh, about the back eye, um, I said, w w what are you really digging into here? And uh, I, I think I expected it to be something to do with gender or um, what the bacchanalian meant uh, in the... Um, both in terms of the, the orgiastic sense, but also in maybe the anti-Apollonian uh, side and in, in the sort of Nietzschean model. So what, what is the essence of the Bacchanalian? Um, and James came back very firmly and said, what we're looking at is uh, the divine. How, how would we know a God if, if a God came among us? And what are the questions that arise from, from, from that central question, both morally, but also theologically, I suppose, and of course, dramatically. And so that is the question that we are unpacking here this evening, um, a little bit in relation to the production, but I think also much more freely in terms of what we all feel personally about that question. And uh, uh, Joan was saying downstairs that, of course, uh, one of the hallmarks maybe of the last, really I guess post the 60s, isn't it, I, that I, is that what seemed to be a slide away from a, uh, an investment in formal religion in internationally, globally, has sort of turned back and... Uh, uh, really the last, all over the world, uh, the last uh, 30 p years in particular have seen yeah. a, great, a sort of a, a, an emergence or a strengthening of, of formalised religion and of course um, many of those faiths, and I'm going to defer to Joan here a little bit on it, well both Joan's in terms of expertise, uh, <coughs> are predicated or, or underwritten as it were by the idea that a, a divine figure may arrive at some point, a, a, a prophet, uh, uh, a king, uh, or, or indeed uh, uh, God, him or herself. Um, so I thought maybe, uh, if I could start with you, Jen, it, it maybe could you give us a little bit of context about maybe, you know, where that idea first might have arrived in antiquity? Uh, mm. Is the back part of a tradition or the beginning of that discussion? And also how you think it sort of has p it played out um, sort of in the major faiths? Well, a big, I mean, big in terms of the ancient Greeks, they had gods appearing all the time among them in various different forms and Zeus was appearing and mm -hmm. made manifest to various different women and that of course has given rise to Dionysus himself mm -hmm. who's really a, a demigod, mm -hmm. he has a human, a, a, a human mother. So um, in the ancient Greek world they knew who the gods were, they didn't, you didn't have to define mm -hmm. what a god was. But for us, we do, mm -hmm. and I think that makes it your question much harder because mm -hmm. we don't know what we're talking about mm -hmm. <laughs> when we talk about God or mm -hmm. the gods. Um, but for the Greeks, it was just, you know, this is part of what we know. It's part of our culture. Mm -hmm. And of course, um, the, the Dion Dionysic festivals mm -hmm. is where we have theatre beginning. You mm -hmm. know, th this is part of the experience of, of the divine when you go to theatre. So mm -hmm. celebrating Dionysus is, is in some way um, giving manifestation to tragedies, mm -hmm. um, to, uh, to everything that you experience in the, in the theatre of Dionysus mm -hmm. and Athens and mm -hmm. elsewhere. So um, that integral relationship between a sort of manifestation of the God mm -hmm. and culture, mm -hmm. something to do with art, mm -hmm. something to do with human experience, I think it, that's all wrapped up. In uh, uh, and what about the, the idea of anticipating the arrival of a divine figure? I mean, that oh, it seems very hardwired into the yes. Judeo-Christian kind of faiths. W w what's the root of that, do you think? Or well, um, 
divine figure or messenger yeah. of the divine. Um, within Judaism and Christianity, it's much more the sense of there being certain people who carry a divine message. Mm -hmm. And how do you determine whether or not they are true, prophet. true prophets or false prophets? Well, mm -hmm. true prophets, ultimately their prophecy comes true. So mm -hmm. um, it's only with the benefit of hindsight that you can really work it out mm -hmm. um, at the time they arrive, there can be all sorts of issues. Mm -hmm. So Jeremiah, his life wasn't exactly a bed of roses and, um, and of course Jesus. Mm -hmm. uh, so th the world can turn against a true prophet rather than celebrate mm -hmm. them. So um, what, what do you think is psychologically under, uh, is behind this sort of anxiety of anticipation for the divine? I mean, obviously in, in Beckett, it's the, it's the hallmark of, Beckett's most famous play. Yes, so indeed, wait we're waiting for him. Um, oh. Well, we will go on waiting because there is a great human need for explanation. Mm -hmm. there, there needs to be an explanation for how this is mm -hmm. and why we're here and what we're doing here and where we're going. Um, and the gods moving among you and raping bulls mm. and uh, behaving as showers of gold in a totally uh, scandalous ways was one way of saying, well, that's their power, that's what they're doing, and, uh, and they're mixing with us. I think the mixing of gods with people was a very important element of those early religions. Um, but then, then we, we go on to, and we're looking for someone who is, the, the word is self-fulfilling really, charismatic, that we are looking for someone who offers an explanation, a plausible explanation, and they keep on coming. Um, they don't come very often. Um, some of them stick mm -hmm. and we look to them for explanations and out of our belief in their explanations spring our, uh, the latest version of rituals, hierarchies, power, control, rules and authority and they, they constitute religious churches. <coughs> That's a Christian word, I don't, <coughs> I don't particularly apply it only to Christianity. But today's um, prophets are people like um, the man who founded Scientology. Ron mm -hmm. Hubbard, mm -hmm. who's a scoundrel and a man who wrote science fiction yeah. literature. Um, so I b he might well have been charismatic for all I know, but he was certainly a false mm. prophet. Um, the explanations are gobbledygook. Um, Mary Baker Eddy founded Christian Science. Interesting mm. that these, those two both founded, founded versions of religion which include the word science in them. Mm -hmm. that's, that's telling, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure what it's telling, but mm -hmm. it's in Scientology um, um, and um, Christian Science mm -hmm. as explanations, explana answers for the questions we're asking. Mm -hmm. And she was clearly a very powerful and strong woman. There's about 70,000 people still follow um, that church. And I've been out to meet them in America, and they're extremely devout and totally convinced. Um, so the, the gods keep coming, um, and it's up to us to decide whether we find them credible. Mm. Um, I find, you know, the Ron Hubbard and the Mary um, Baker Eddy less credible than I think than Dionysus, mm -hmm. because Dionysus is a brilliant reflection created, as he is, out of the minds of the people who conceived him, of the psychology of human nature, mm. mm -hmm. which is what gods express. Mm -hmm. uh, do you, so, do you think that uh, in in your opinion, that um, uh, narratives that present a god, plays or books that, that give you a god figure, do you think they are there to um, close down or open up discussion? Oh, open up, absolutely, because, because they, are, they are hitting at the very basic conceptions of human consciousness, mm -hmm. which is what explains. You know, are they the first cause? Are they before the Big Bang. Mm -hmm. um, there's no way you can close down any of these discussions because there is not an explanation. Mm -hmm. I mean, Richard Dawkins will say that um, there is no God because there is science and it explains everything. And we go back to the Big Bang and everything since then has been explicable, but what came before the Big Bang? Mm -hmm. And the answer is always, it's a mystery. Mm -hmm. And that's what the gods are. The gods are the mystery that answers our need to know. Mm -hmm. hmm. I agree, and I, I think it's actually quite healthy that we're in a time of ferment and seeking. I don't think that's a bad thing at all. And if you look back on the history of the world, 
these times have come over and over again as people have gone through certain ways of doing things and there's been a sort of sense of this is how we operate, this is how we do temple cult in the Greek world. You know, we sacrifice, we do these things, that's fine. Um, and then there's a time where everything goes, ugh, you know, topsy-turvy and, and no one really knows and there's a lot of different ideas about. So at the, the turn of the, of the millennium when Jesus fortuitously just arrived, um, in fact it was on a backdrop with a lot of people in the Greek and Roman world going, I don't know what's going on anymore, these old gods, what do they mean to me? Nothing. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm going to get involved in a mystery cult. I'm going to go along to a a, a Bacchic mystery and I'm going to experience something intense and it's going to take me to a a mystical place that, you know, going to the Temple of Athena is not going to do for me at all. So you get this kind of concurrent sort of civic religion alongside a much more personal, experience-based religion Mm -hmm. of people going into these different sorts of... um, movements and then out of that this, this comes philosophy, stoic ideas, neo-platonic ideas, everyone thinking about life, the universe and, and everything. And then Christianity, huge disruption in terms of what happened in the, the fourth century. Then things settle down into a sort of normative, this is how we do things, this is what we think. Um, but I think we're now at this phase where we're turning again, the world is turning, and science is making the world turn, and everyone has to actually ask themselves, what, does, what is life all about? Mm-hmm. And we come up with different solutions. Different ideas, um, yeah. But there are people in lots of different religious traditions, mm-hmm. I think, who can act as guides. Mm-hmm. Um, it seems that there are a lot of, um, when you present a, a god or a prophet on stage or, or, or in a story, um, Obviously, in the Christian tradition, um, it's um, educative, largely, sort of, you know, look how he's behaved, we should all follow that Mm -hmm. example. Um, I mean, not entirely, but I mean, and often that that might be positing a a revolutionary social position as well to its times. Um, One of the things that I find fascinating about the Bacchae, or or indeed Greek drama full stop, is that... um, it's much less clear quite what we've got to take from that story. I mean, w- what the crimes were that Pentheus and Agarwe may have committed. I mean, I know they, 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 they do exist, but the, the punishment seems to far outweigh the, uh, the crime. Mm. Um, and it, you know, certainly when I watch our production, I feel um, it, it's quite sort of um, totalitarian. I exist, bow down. That is all you need to know. And, and Gods do do that. They're very bossy. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> gods are by nature bossy. Um, mm. the, the Greek gods, particularly, were not moral. Mm-hmm. They are so often what is fun- very uh, immoral, but they're forces, they're scary forces. Mm-hmm. And something like um, Bacchus, Dionysus, represents all of the energy of of the universe, the, mm. the natural energy, the wild energy of animals, the what happens when you get drunk, mm-hmm. terror. All of these things are bound up in uh, Dionysus. And, and you go along your happy little path in your city to your peril if you don't recognise that there's a world out there that you've got to acknowledge. I think there's another, you'll correct me if I, you know more about the actual <coughs> structure of religions, but it seems that many, many religions seek to change human consciousness mm. one way or another either by um, ecstatic dancing or whirling dervishes or contemplation or um, speaking in tongues. They all seek to change human consciousness as though just, you know, hewing wood and and drawing water isn't enough. Mm -hmm. The human consciousness wants to push itself beyond drugs, have a role Mm -hmm. in all of that. And of course, that's the Dionysic spirit Mm -hmm. that wants to break through what the limitations of <coughs> daily consciousness mm-hmm. and experience yet more. And I think one of the things that puts your, I'm, I'm going to, this is a spoiler alert. <laughs> <laughs> this is a spoiler alert for those who haven't mm-hmm. yet seen the play. But what puts your uh, production here at the heart of modern awareness is that, um, that Dionysus is played <coughs> bisexually that he looks very much like Conchita Hurst, mm-hmm. the, person, the person who won mm-hmm. the Eurovision Song Contest, male and female. 
And I think that's a very interesting development to have brought the element of male and female as one into the nature of the god. Mm. And it's long yeah. overdue. <laughs> <laughs> here, here. Mm. Um, I'd like to speak on, on, you said that religions are, are here to raise consciousness or to, uh, to bring consciousness into being and uh, there's more than hunting and drawing water and the, the, the bear being alive. And of course, I guess for people like me, we very uh, almost protectively declare that as, as arts territory, and, and this, is, yeah. this is the function of culture to mm -hmm. do that, and, and um, religion is a sort of prescriptive limitation compared to the free imagination. It's pretty theatrical, isn't it? I mean, I would yeah. have thought, you know, a good service at Westminster Abbey is pretty much like a piece of stage theatre. Uh, but I suppose I would say I would much rather live in a soci society with lots of art and no religion than the other way around. Well, I agree about uh, that. I would feel more conscious. Uh, but they do answer a similar need. And, but what do you think the relationship between them is then? But they mm. overlap. I mean, this is go goes back to the Dionysius festivals mm. from which theatre arose mm. in the first place. You know all of this yeah, too. Sure, they sure. were, you know, chanting around about the gods, mm. and then suddenly you get one actor, and then you get another yeah. actor, and they they restage things, and and the altar of Dionysus becomes ultimately the stage. Sure, but I, but I suppose uh, for me, I, I feel religion springs from the question. What happens when we die? What, what, what does death mean? Whereas art springs from the question of how, how shall I live? Oh, I don't uh, think you're quite right. <laughs> <laughs> because a, a lot of uh, thinking about religion is about how you live. Um, what is life? What, uh, what are we doing here? Goodness. But, but, but a lot of that is about so you can have a good death. But I think that you're being influenced very much by the Christian understanding <laughs> of what religion is uh, as being as about salvation the towards yeah. the, the afterlife. It's, it's there in Judaism, it's there in Islam. It's it there, it, it's it there. is, but, but ultimately, even the thinking about what the afterlife is pushes you back to think about what your life is here and now. So it sh you shouldn't be, anyway, in terms of that religion, uh, a religious understanding, just thinking, oh, you know, I'm okay, I, I know what I believe I, I, and I'm going to... I know one should, I know, I know it shouldn't be a reward-based activity, yeah. but I still think <laughs> that the, 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 the need to ask... You know, I've got young children who go to a Catholic school, my wife's Catholic, and so they, I've, I see mm. what happens to you know, a young mind first encountering death, and that is a very big part of human consciousness, I think, when you first come to terms with the idea of death, particularly human death, but, but it can be a pet or something as well. And how do I explain that it is gone feels like a very central, the central animator of, uh, of religion. And, and, you know, Christianity itself is, is in a way a glorified death cult, isn't it? It's I mean, it's, it's, but, it's, but it's useless. Isn't, aren't, there are no answers, are no. there? No religion comes up with a satisfactory answer. It comes up with an intriguing story. Mm -hmm. And that's the most you can ever know. But some people will, will say that is the answer. Well, in, uh, well indeed, um, you, can be, you can believe that. You can't verify it. So it is, it is entirely a matter of the imagination and the consciousness that you embrace it. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't mean make it, we're in danger of saying some of it's true and some of it's not true. Do you know, it's all true because it's going on in your consciousness. Mm -hmm. So it's both true and not true insofar as you're dealing with your own thoughts and attitudes. It's fed by these wonderful stories of all kinds from the ancient Greeks to the Catholic, modern Catholic exposition of Christ, but they all hit your consciousness. And one of the things I discovered when I did this series in which you spoke, that I, s I interviewed lots and lots of Christians and Muslims and Sikhs and atheists and Jews and so on. Every individual had a totally original take on what their religion was. There were no two identical accounts which seemed to me to demonstrate that it's, it's cooked in your brain, which is only to celebrate how absolutely sensationally brilliant the human brain is and how imaginative. Mm -hmm. And that's what the theatre does too. The theatre unfolds mm -hmm. how wonderful human life is. And mm -hmm. I think that's where, what it has in common with religion. I suppose, I suppose to, I'm going to keep flo flogging my, <laughs> um, my art first horse, but um, the... Uh, a sort of chicken and egg question for me is which comes first, the story or the God? The, does the story produce an idea of the divine or does our need for the divine mean that we make up a story about it? And um, I feel that, the, that what art does is it starts purely with the story 
And I, that's what I question with, with religion, is whether it's coming from the same. Well, does art always start with the story? There's a <laughs> question. Um, I, I, going back to what Joan said before about um, the psyche, the human psyche, and how this kind of story, that uh, what religion does, is work something out within mm. the human psyche. Art and religion both do something, um, and they challenge the human psyche. In, in ways that uh, the rational mind doesn't quite expect. Mm -hmm. So I think both uh, the, the stories of religion, and, and I'm not just thinking the, the, the ritual <coughs> stories of religion, that the religion holistically, the spiritual dimensions of religion, mm -hmm. the things that are not necessarily on the surface of religion, they, they draw people in mm -hmm. and they, as Joan said, you, you participate in the story and ultimately the story does something to the psyche, which is ultimately to open something up that you might not have expected would be opened up. And theatre art does that mm -hmm. as well. Now, religion can fail to do that, mm -hmm. and in a way that's the death of religion. Mm -hmm. When religion gets safe, and religion gets uh, kind of, oh, this is what we do on Sunday, mm -hmm. just along. Mm -hmm. um, then it's not actually doing what it's supposed to be doing to the human um, mm -hmm. consciousness. Can I, can the I other I element they have in common, of course, is ritual mm. and the need for, the human, for human behaviour to have processes through which it goes. There is, uh, you see in uh, your children, I'm mm -hmm. sure, the need for ritual. This is how we do things together. And community ritual is a very bonding um, element in all kind of um, societies. It makes for peaceful agreement as opposed to war. Um, and it feeds the need for have, having demonstrating that you have something in common with your fellow human beings. Mm -hmm. And I think, that in a way, that's something that the, the drama does too. Mm -hmm. what, what about the the hum? I mean, obviously, the the back I presents uh, a man or man woman, or, or, or uh, uh, but very much an anthropomorphic figure as a, a god or a demigod. And, and uh, some religions lead, and obviously, Christianity very heavily with that. Um, uh, but and again, I'm, I'm no expert here, but it, it's right to say Buddhism, or there are other faiths that maybe are less anthropomorphic in. Identity. Do, do, do you think you can, you can, are the characteristics of religions that want to cohere around a figure, a, 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 mm. a, 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 a human, humanistic figure, as opposed to ones that maybe are more mystical or? Yes, anthropomorphic manifestations happen in all religions they, that I yeah. know of in one way or another, but then there's also the non-anthropomorphic mm -hmm. and some religions more than others. Um, I think uh, a, a lot of it, the attraction for, uh, for people who are attracted to Buddhism right now is that it can sort of lead you into something a little bit more um, deeper, less anthropomorphic, mm -hmm. more profound, I think, more quickly than perhaps Catholicism where that is there as well, but mm -hmm. you tend to sort of get all of the saints and, uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and all of the theology that can be quite um, hard going to, to get through. Um, I think that uh, all religions can lead to a mystical heart, shall we say. Mm -hmm. um, now, in terms of the anthropomorphic elements of the gods, in Hinduism we have a lot of anthropomorphism, mm -hmm. but we have a lot of that leading beyond it as mm. well. So I think it's very interesting in Hinduism how they managed to do both. Mm -hmm. yes, it's very jolly Hinduism, isn't <laughs> it? Lots of, lots of um, gods having a good time and mm. other gods having a very fierce time and wonderful stories. Mm. Mm. Um, and I think, that's, uh, I, I think that's a really contributory element of why, if you travel in India, there's a sort of, well, you know, life's like that. There's a sort of fatalism mm. about the fact these gods are moving among us and deciding things and we don't have to worry about them. Mm -hmm. But it is interesting, and if you want to get into real trouble, I challenge you to do a play that puts Muhammad on the stage. I mean, that is absolutely unacceptable. Um, and indeed, uh, you're not meant to show representations of Muhammad at all, as you know, although early, there are early texts which did have um, a picture of um, the prophet um, moving among his um, uh, supporters um, and then after a very short time after his death these fell away and they still exist but they are not ever reproduced in uh, Islamic and I, d I doubt if they're reproduced in a 
any other culture because they are not, you're not meant to look upon the face of the prophet. Now, if you're not meant to look upon the, the human God mm -hmm. who is the prophet, you have to become contemplative because you are left with the most brilliant elements of abstract design and symmetry and geometry that is what um, is the background of the iconography of Islam. Mm -hmm. And that really is almost more meditative mm -hmm. than you know, the Virgin Mary at the foot of the cross because it is one degree more abstract. Mm -hmm. And it may well be that in that sense, Islam is trying to direct you at something less uh, attached to the human story mm -hmm. that's the basis of that account because they don't have the story of someone uh, who died to re redeem mankind mm -hmm. which is a very a very human very dramatic very theatrical story yeah mm -hmm. it seems that the I would generalize hugely but <laughs> could, could one talk of two traditions in the presentation of the divine uh, in dramatic narrative one where about how far humans can aspire to the divine and I'm thinking particularly that's, that's a much more Shakespearean model, I suppose, that the sort of um, Coriolanus, uh, uh, Macbeth, I suppose, kind of characters trying reaching for a, t a sort of domination versus the increasingly humanized divine figures. And it's uh, I was I, I spent quite a lot of time in America recently and really feel that a huge um, flowering of the Marvel franchise and the celebration of the superhero. Um, identity feels very mm. close to uh, faith in America, actually, and that, that like, mm. like, how can we think of mm. um, uh, divine f uh, characters with human characteristics? No, I, c I can believe that absolutely, because of course it is supernatural intervention. Yeah. That's what we're talking about. That is what religion is: supernatural in 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 intervention. If it or comes in a red cloak yeah. or whatever. That, the, that the is, uh, it is mm. miraculous. Yeah. Mm. And uh, there's been some wonderful studies of um, the concept of religion as it plays out in sports games, in mm. terms of sports heroes, and of course rock stars, mm. um, the, the cult of rock stars, the way that they have all of this adulation, mm -hmm. and uh, great religious studies, you know, theses on the Beatles and what mm. they did in terms of the language of religion. Um, mm. So. I, uh, this sort of thing can play out in quite secular ways and we yeah. again we get back to something in the human psyche mm -hmm. and something that is being harnessed by forces that can seem out of human control sure. um, which we have in the back eye yeah. this th this integration of um, these very very powerful ecstatic mm -hmm. mystical but also bonkers sure. forces <laughs> that could be quite dangerous yeah uh, so and what do so we do and so just return to the back eye then how how I guess when we've been exploring um, classical Athens and this whole season we're doing there are a set of values to do with you know the birth of democracy and justice and mm. if not quite egalitarianism some sort of sense of citizenship because of ideas that are still really central to our uh, sense of liberal society now and yet here we have uh, a story that is sort of oppositional to all that you know uh, uh, you know crazy people off of their heads for no apparent reason other than they've been infested by a mm -hmm. god you know a totally arbitrary seemingly cruel divine intervention it feels an odd set of myths to be exploring in a, in, a, in a culture that seems more enlightened, I suppose. Yeah, I, I think it, The Back Eye is Euripides' most mysterious play mm -hmm. because he has come from this whole culture, as you say, you know, the classical Athens, mm. the Athens of Pericles, mm -hmm. all of this great stuff ha happening. He's the disciple of Anaxagoras, who, um, great philosopher, believed that the foundation of the universe was in a universal mind. Mm -hmm. Wasn't that interested in all of the, the gods, um, Euripides, not doing what other people were doing in terms of saying everything is down to the gods, much more a rationalist, mm -hmm. and the rationalist Euripides is the one who writes the back eye. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it will always remain one of these deep mysteries and and people have speculated you know at the end of Euripides life was he tired of the Peloponnesian war you know mm -hmm. uh, what was going on did he reflect on this kind of aspect of human nature 
really. Uh, but, really there's big something of the Freud of his day. <laughs> he wa- yeah. Well, it must I be. I mean, he saw the divided human psyche mm. and he represented it in, in, with, with all its risks and with all its virtues. The virtues harking back to what he had, had learned the democratic principles mm. and people speaking one to another. And then the terrifying dangers, which of course always go with religion. Reli- the, red, the record of religion is not good. Religions kill, religions mm. fight. And religions have crusades, it's a religious word. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's very much around at the moment, it's terrifying. Shall we throw it open a little bit and see whether anyone wants to share any thoughts or ask anything about either the back eye or um, things that stirred up the question? Does anyone have any questions at all? Don't be shy. If you take the Greek gods, which seem to conflict, what is the difference between that and psychoanalysis? Oh, you've got to use Jung or Freud. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I think it's the need to understand. I think we have sequences throughout um, social history which people have struggled to understand each other and themselves. And in that sense, the Christian faith that tries, that's the one I know, that tries to unfold what might be good about human nature and bad about human nature and how one infiltrates the other is also the explanations that you get in um, a a non-religious community of people who are analysing the human mind. Um, They're all part of trying to understand the mystery and it it can never be understood, which is why it will never die out. Mm. I mean, one of the things about the back eye, a a psychoanalytical um, reading of it, as was quite common at one time, um, is that it is the, uh, it, in Jungian terms, it's like the shadow, the shadow that wells up inside the psyche and wants you to rush headlong and to do all the things you shouldn't be doing. Um, whereas on the other side, you have Pentheus, who is the rational mind that says, you know, this is what we should be doing, and, um, and, and it's ordered, and it's rational, and there's a hierarchy, and down the bottom of the hierarchy, there's slaves and women, and, and old people aren't great either, and, uh, you know, in the, in the back eye, um, the old, but it's, it's in, in the back eye, it's the old, it's the women, it's the marginal people, it's the, 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 the shepherds who are very taken by um, this force um, so th- the hierarchical mind that wants to put everything in order is then overturned by this power um, that wants recognition from the, the mind. And that's all. You know, it doesn't need to be like you have to do A, B, C. It just recognise that I am there. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's really the, the nature of the worship. And, so it, and it hits at an eternal truth, doesn't it? Which, which is just thinking and logic doesn't get you out of problems. You do need passion. The, the, the one doesn't solve things and the other doesn't solve things. You do need both. Mm. They both have to exist together. And if you try and clamp it down, it might just come and destroy you. I mean, that's <laughs> yes. the, it does, it does <laughs> the, the scary, play. scary bit of it. So yeah. It also seems that analysis, I suppose, feels something transactional between uh, d- two or individuals, whereas, th- whereas theatre and arguably religion, although not all religions, is uh, a collective I- experience. There's something about mm. you know, thousands of people sitting in Epidaurus and watching, Epidaurus and watching the show. And the and what, what, what do you think is going on there, actually? What do, you, do, do you think that, that need for co- the collective response is part of... Yeah, it certainly is. But, but I think that it, people can have their individual responses as well. That, mm-hmm. uh, both in religion and in theatre, there is the collective and the individual yes. experience. So that does create a, an overlap. Yes, and I think the one helps the other. I think to be in company of people who are all individually responding to something, there is something going on, isn't there? There is a sort of universal consciousness that, that feeds one to the other. You can feel it in... Uh, in a great religious ritual, and you can feel it in a great uh, production. But you asked me earlier, did yeah. I like the play? And I, and I said, yes, I went reeling out into the night. And the fact was that I went home thinking, and not just thinking with my logical brain, but, res- but still 
echoing, vibrating with the impact that the play had had on me. So that it was visceral as well as intellectual. Maybe I just went home to have some supper. I mean, I'm building it into something a bit grand. But I did, you know, the play echoed really through that day and the next. Oh, and, and what was so the impact? <laughs> what was it stirring? It stirred a sense of um, the, the, the scale of human experience mm. and the scale of the attempt to explain it. And that it, it is absolutely crystallizes that. Mm. The, that's why it's an absolute masterpiece. That it, it gets to the essence of this might explain things. And there's the severe Pentheus, so logical and right and sensible. And you know that bit of your own brain. And then there's Dionysus, who's reckless and, you know tortured and wants to talk and you know that bit of your own identity too so we carry away mm -hmm. what this play uh, epitomizes it, it characterizes the very essence of what it is to be human mm -hmm. and also the, the, the consequences of that in the, in the crazed women who mm -hmm. go completely you know mad, are mad and uh, ferocious and deadly and that how that can so quickly mm -hmm. be triggered in human life and it and it is being triggered all the time. Mm. But so I, I'm working on this production of Madeira at the moment. We're in rehearsals, and <laughs> the um, uh, the writer of the diversion that we're doing, uh, her her inquiry is these stories that are about female hysteria, written by men mm. thousands of years ago, performed by men almost entirely in front of men, uh, <coughs> are a sort of fetishization of a, a, a male anxiety about female behaviour, and um, and. So for her, she says, you know, wh what is it to come, a bunch of men to come and watch three other men pretend that one of them's a woman who's killed her children? I mean, wh what's going on there? What is, what is being unpacked in that? And Male anxiety, yeah. I think we could say. <laughs> do, you, do you feel that in the back eye as well? Th that um, there's a sort of uh, well, I say an I uneasy voyeurism about what they do well, <laughs> I, I th when they're when they, together? When the Greeks wrote about hu human condition, they wrote about men because that's who they were i mean they re as you said they weren't men at the theater mm. it was men in the audience mm. women didn't go to the audience uh, to see the plays slaves didn't go to see the plays so we're talking about men's discourse mm -hmm. and men's fears and anxieties and perhaps with the women out of the way they felt able to take <laughs> on these amazing mm -hmm. eruptions of violence and uh, anxiety that that men feel about women mm -hmm. and still do and i think um to that extent, they belong in their era, but they also speak to us about how we've changed things and mm. how, and that's also what I took away from the play, thinking, yes, women, <laughs> about time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, yeah, I, uh, I, f I do think it's very interesting what happens in terms of the women, uh, the back eye themselves, and um, it, it's not a, a woman's liberation piece at all because mm -hmm. of the, the way it has <laughs> <laughs> the, the idea that unbridled women out there will just go crazy. Mm. Um, but, um, but it does raise a lot of different issues about, um, given that Pentheus and the way he says uh, at one point, you know, oh, I'll just enslave all of these women, they'll be weaving on my looms, mm. you know, oh, you know. Um, he's not the person we want to follow here. Um, mm. So that kind of very misogynistic, oppressive attitude to women is not being accepted mm. as, as what the audience is al al Although the, the arguably the greatest trauma is inflicted on Agarwe, who is his mother. Yeah, so I mean, it's so a absolutely <laughs> horrific. Um, but, but it also, in terms of what happened in the, in the history of religion, it did license a cult of Dionysus for women. Mm -hmm. And there are inscriptions in the first century showing that, you know, women were allowed to go out of the city and participate in these cults in the woods <laughs> and you know goodness knows what happened um, but they, it, it, there was this kind of uh, women's religious cult uh, mm -hmm. around Dionysus and some men were involved with that as well and so there's something about um, licensing mm -hmm. a certain um, 
limited liberation of, of women at the time that allowed them to leave the household mm. and of course in ancient Greece women in the household were as shut up as in the, the Taliban's mm. Afghanistan. They were very, very shut up if you were a, um, a non-slave woman. So um, that allowed them to say, we, we can actually go off and do this stuff. Mm. Um, and religion was the way that women got out of the household in ancient Greece. Whether it's it, it is interesting, or whatever. But th th this play, the back, has been d revised and put it done in uh, different versions by many feminist playwrights. Mm. I mean, Carol Churchill mm. um, had a go. I think S um, Stella Duffy might have done. Oh. I'm not sure, but I, I think there are quite a, a number of women who've said we really got to deal with the back eye and see what yeah. we can make it, unpick it from a, a, a sense of, uh, of women's liberation. What are we to make of a play this great? Um, which seems to tell us we're, we're the crazy part of humanity. Um, and we, we need to understand how that has arisen and how we can interpret it. Yeah, I mean, you, can, you can imagine if you could get the Taliban into a theatre, they might approve. Uh, <laughs> so the part that, that, um, uh, I don't think there's any danger in Islington. But, um, <laughs> um, any, any other questions? At all? I, I don't know if this is um, relevant for long, but um, do you think there's a need in society and religion martyrs. Um, you've got uh, Pentheus, obviously, who is, you might say, martyred in, in, in the, in the back But I was thinking back to what you were all saying about you know, rock and pop and you know, do we need our Amy Winehouse? You know, does, does society need, um, or religion need, to create people who are as damaged by religion as they are? Well, I was thinking earlier when you were talking about drama and religion, I was thinking of uh, uh, Bernard Shaw, St. Joan, and the presentation of St. Joan as um, the victim of uh, ho having her voices and responding to them and then being the victim of um, social change and destroyed by it, and of course since becoming a, a, one of the saints. Um, Saints are very useful dramatically and pictorially. I mean, I think, I think there's, you, know, you couldn't have the Renaissance without all the saints. Where would we be without all those amazing figures? So I do think they offer, I think in, in terms of observing religion, um, it's people have their own saint, don't they? And they the, to whom they light a candle and to whom they pray. And I think the individualizing of your own anxieties in the representation of someone is satisfied. I'm speaking as someone who does not have a faith or indeed mm. a saint, um, but I think that must be very gratifying and it fits the hierarchy very well. Yeah, yeah. I, I think what martyrs tend to do, uh, martyrdom stories, is they ultimately critique the society that's responsible for the martyr's sorry end. So um, they, they can serve a very good purpose Mm. In, in getting people to reflect on <laughs> what has <laughs> happened. Um, it, 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 you know, but, but I also find them repellent as well. Some of the martyrdom stories, especially the, the martyrdom stories are in early Christianity, um, they, they seem to, a bit like in the, in the back eye really, really go into the details mm. of the, the horrific things that happened to the saints. So I don't know why do we need that gratuitous violence that we get in some of these stories? I don't know. Is, is there something that we, we need with that? I don't know. Um, but it does serve as the social criticism, you know, the bad ruler who does this to the martyr. Um, what is society that has created this kind of environment where the good saint will suffer? I think that violence, I mean, I remember reading Fox's Book of Martyrs for, uh, for research for Shakespeare, which is a, a bestseller in the late uh, 16th century and is about the most violent text I think I've ever read. Mm -hmm. And that's only a, a brief history of mm -hmm. Marian Catholic burnings, really. Um, but it, 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 you know, I think that's one of the things that ISIS have done so successfully is sort of seize on the iconography of violence in, in, in martyrdoms in a, in a kind of aggressive way. The, the one thing I would say about um, theatre is a great line in Aeschylus, which is sort of the DNA of all theatre really, which is th through suffering comes understanding and that seems at the heart of, I don't think I've ever done a play where that hasn't, at some, if you could reduce all plays to one mm -hmm. phrase it probably would be that, you know, comedies and tragedies, through suffering comes understanding. Now, whether that's true of all religions, I don't know, um, or even of, of society, but um, the idea that we only learn through harm 
is, is, is very important. Well, you know, in Buddhism, life is suffering. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it, that's the bottom line, recognising that there is a certain amount of suffering that you will experience, and then, you know, you go from that point mm -hmm. uh, into a deeper reality of what you need to understand about the nature of your existence. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I myself find it abhorrent that religion almost emphasises that through suffering we come to redemption. Mm -hmm. um, you know, offer it up is the Catholic prayer, isn't it? Whatever your suffering is, offer your suffering up to God and it will be brownie points in the, in the hereafter. I mean, the idea of elevating suffering to a virtue I find uh, extremely um, unacceptable. But um, you see, th it, and it's a hierarchy. It's a. It offers a hierarchy of control too, because it promises mm. that you, you, your suffering is sent by God to test you. Well, what kind of God is that? Mm. Exactly. Mm. That's what I was going to say. It, it ties in with this idea about what God is, and of course, you know, we're, we're reaching the end of the hour, mm. <laughs> and it, it is a, a central question of you know what is the relationship between the universal consciousness, God, the life itself, and our individual existence. Um, and so th if you've got a God that has got this kind of hierarchy, you know, up at there in the clouds and sort of wielding all of these events and, and just testing you, then, you know, of course you're going to suffer. This is <laughs> the, the nature of, of your life. Um, but I guess uh, it, it does all go down to, um, then also wondering um, about the nature of your own individual existence and your relationship with the cosmos mm. um, and uh, how you can think in a different way yeah. um, and experience things in a different way. So, yeah, I'm yeah. rambling now. I better stop. <laughs> I would say that certainly if I look at the commissions we've got out, if I meet a happy writer, I know I'm not going to get my play. <laughs> 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 so there's something about you know uh, trauma or grief that seems to be more likely to produce produce me the document. Do you uh, think, do you think um, Shakespeare was a traumatized person? I think he was rather a, a well balanced, wasn't he? I think he was very materialist, so he knew he was mm. right. I think he wrote to the clock. But um, yeah, I don't. I think you, you read some of the plays and you feel. He must have been in a bad place during some of them, um, uh, and, and you know all the more recent books about you know whether that's to do with his faith and to do with mm. a sort of a hidden Catholicism and yeah, and, well, uh, was he was he not? Yeah. Um, he, I don't think I think he was pretty indifferent to religion. Yes, there are there isn't there's no Almost hymn none. to yeah. religion of any kind in any of the plays, no. is there? Except in the mouths of someone who is behaving uh, outrageously. Yeah. Um, so I don't feel that there's strong faith. No, he's a humanist. It, it yeah, he's yeah, a humanist. Yeah. Yeah. It seems to me that the, um, one of the reasons that theatre and uh, religion uh, dance together so much and that religion borrows so much from the rituals of theatre and theatre is so interested in narratives of the divine is that um, both require a belief just to try them out. You know, if I come out and say I'm the Prince of Denmark, you're either going to have to choose to believe me or not. And I know you're not the Prince of Denmark, but for the sake of argument, I'm going to say, OK, you are the Prince of Denmark, and I'll stay with you for a few hours and just see whether th what that means. And it seems to me that's quite similar to religion. It's sort of, OK, well, I'll try it and see how I feel about it. And um, So I suppose uh, maybe I'll conclude by saying thank you all for trying us for an hour and seeing what you felt about <laughs> what we had to say. And uh, to thank our, our panellists, uh, Joan and Joan. And thank you all for coming. Thank you. <laughs>